This is what derails a lot of lives and a lot of careers is that trying to control the timing. So you talk about Hollywood, let's use it for an example. So every, people come to Hollywood, oh, I wanna make it, I wanna make it, I wanna make it. Great, nothing wrong with wanting to make it, nothing wrong with believing you have the talent. However, when we put a time clock on when it has to happen, and then if it doesn't happen by then, we start to judge ourselves, we start to say something's wrong, we start to get upset, we start to numb ourselves because we don't feel good. That's when it becomes destructive. So when you talk about Hollywood, here's what's in anyone's control, how they show up, how they prepare, their disposition, their attitude, their belief, right? It's okay to believe something that no one else believes about you. Nothing wrong with that. But don't let that belief become a burden. Let that belief remain a blessing. Hey, Better Together fans. It's not Maria Menounos, it's Mr. Maria Menounos. Sitting in still for my beautiful and talented wife. And uh, it's it's wonderful to be here. Um, obviously dealing with some tragedy in the family, but uh, you know, the Lord, he or she or they work in mysterious ways. Very so true. we have a great guest today that uh, has been gifted to us that's going to share so much helpful information on life and on expectations, um, finding success. And man, he's had success in so many different areas. I'm uh, super, super excited. I need this one. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm so excited. Well, listen to this. It took over 150,000 hours, over 6,500 6, days from the day I set foot in Hollywood to finally get my production company. That is 150,000 hours of showing up, mm. dot, 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 and serving Kelsey. Damn. Right? And serving. Damn. See, it's not just yeah. like we always hear like hard it's work, not just hard work, work. Right. and serving. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. But still, we hear we still hear this all the time too so i know it like it's almost getting old now to the young people i feel like <laughs> like all right we get it all right so then let me i'm gonna do a second quote Ooh. i've only done this one other Ooh. time but Ready. it's this important what if you get to the end of your life and only did what's expected not what is your destiny mm -hmm. and i think that just speaks to so many people yeah. and especially women who just live their lives by expectations yeah and and you know not by you know, other things which we're going to talk about mm -hmm. tonight. And so, so Devon Franklin's coming on the show tonight with his book, uh, and we're going to go over. But you probably want to know who this guy is, right? Let's Kelsey. hear it. Tell uh, me. <laughs> Devon Franklin is an award-winning producer, New York Times best-selling author, and renowned motivation motivational speaker and preacher. He is the producer of multiple hit films, including The Pink Panther Two, The Karate Kid, Jumping the Broom, and so many more. He is the author of The Truth About Men, The Success Commandments, The Weight, and Produced by Faith. Devon was also named one of the most influential Christians under 40, one of the top 10 producers to watch by Variety, and one of the top 100 influential African Americans in America by Ebony Magazine. Here to share the freedom in getting rid of expectations and so, much, so many other tips to navigating the many challenges today, better together in the Hill Squad. Welcome, Devon Franklin. Devon, can I, are you a pastor as well? No, no, no. People get it mixed up. I'm yeah. not a pastor. I, okay. you know, I, I preach. I've always preached, but I'm not a pastor. You know, a, a pastor to me is someone like my younger brother, who that is their profession. They're responsible to a local congregation. They oversee a physical church. Uh, that's not me. I, okay. I produce films. I write. Uh, you know, I try to help as many people as I can, um, but I never take on that title because I respect those that do that for me. Right. Well, that's why I wanted to ask because I respect it so much too. So I would, I would want to say pastor, you know, or but okay. But I love that. You have that in you, you know, it's incredible. And with your upbringing, you talk about being raised by like a, a, a core of strong women. Right. And I and I, I feel like the, the men who kind of um, get it today are the ones who are raised by strong women. And then obviously you had your uncle and you had yeah. uh, you had a pastor. So you had so you had this great balance. Yes, I think. Right. And uh, I, I remember like Julia uh, Maria Shriver said this about Obama. Is that she felt he was that he was he mm -hmm. there was just enough man in him when he needed to be a man, but then there was enough like uh, empathy and sensitivity, mm -hmm. and 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 he had that balance as well. Wow! And but it's... can can you speak to yours though, like where where it all came from with you? Yeah, you know, I mean, I was raised. I mean, my father passed away. My father, when he was alive, was kind of in and out of 
uh, me and my brother's lives. He um, struggled with alcoholism and uh, he ultimately he got sober before he passed away, but he did end up having a massive heart attack at the age of 36. Oof. And so it left me, I'm the middle child of three boys. So my mother became a single parent uh, and she raised us. And then she had help from my grandmother and my grandmother's seven sisters. And so I kind of refer to them as my, you know, coalition of, of black women that really helped uh, pick up the, the slack, so to speak, and to help my mother, uh, you know, raise me and my brothers. And so having that balance of, you know, being young men, but being surrounded by women and they, you know, they taught us everything about life and everything about uh, love and all the things that we know my mom and my, my great aunts taught us. So it was really having that support system. And then my grandfather would, would, you know, plug in, you know, occasionally and my uncle would plug in. So we really did have a great mix of, of influences in our life. And so I think a lot of what I do now is a reflection of all of those influences being poured into me at such a young age. Um, and he's got, he obviously you have so many books in you. I swear we could do one on just trying to make it in show business. You know what I mean? Then you could do one on, right? Yeah, but then there's one on even how to make it in career and life. But like, let's focus on this book and let's talk about expectations because I can't tell you how many people when I coach celebrities or help people in Hollywood um, or people trying to break in the business, so much of uh, so much of them is polluted or held back by societal expectations, parental expectations. Can you talk about that? Oh my goodness! I mean, it's why I wrote this book and why I'm so excited about this message because you know the book "Live Free" is all about how to deal with expectations, and people do not realize expectations are weights, and the more that we take on, especially those imposed on us from other people or the culture, the more pressure we feel, the more stressed out we feel. So the reason why I wanted to write this book is to shine a light on what expectations are and then really give tips and tools on how to deal with them. Because if we don't deal with our expectations, if we don't manage our expectations, then they're going to manage us. And one of the reasons why most of us may not be happy is because there are expectations that we have not yet managed and set. You know, and this, this is going to sound, this is not crazy enough topic. And, um, you know, I, as, as I hear more criticism of, of capitalism come along. And when I was young, I just understood, you know, my generation was communism, Soviet Union, bad, capitalism, America, good. And it was simple and easy. It was my Disney view. But then as I've gotten <laughs> right. older, uh, you know, so, there have been people who've educated me on sometimes like that, you know, when you're in a society of like, have more, need more, uh, you know, you have these expectations, I have to be this successful, like, right? So, so does, that kind of plays into it, too, would you say? Absolutely. I have a section in the book called cultural expectations. And in that section, I deal with the very thing that you're hitting on, is that a lot of times if we just stop and think, and I ask this question in the book, are you really living the life that you want? And in my experience, from the people that come to me for help, most people are not living their actual life. They're living a life for someone else. So to your point, you know, in a, in a capitalistic society, the idea is that more is always better. So if I don't have more, then there's something wrong. And that's actually not true. And but, but what happens is you, if, if you're not careful, you take that expectation from the culture and then you use it as a barometer to judge yourself good or bad. And, and the problem is that that means you are not living free. I'm not living free if I allow the culture to set the expectation that I live by. Oh my I, and my, I and myself, you and yourself, should be the only one to have the power to set the expectation that you live by. It doesn't mean that we can't agree with some expectations for the culture. We can agree with whatever expectation we That's want. That's right. Or align with them. Yeah. That's right. But it has to be our choosing, not because we feel obligated that we won't become who we need to be if we don't. And and so in the book we talk about, or you, well, we, I'm taking ownership, it, <laughs> uh, this personal, cultural, relational, and professional. So let, let's talk yeah. about the personal expectations, okay? Like, you know, where, where do they stem from? Yeah, personal expectations, you know, stem from, uh, you know, one, just who we are, right? And who we want to be. And a lot of times these personal expectations come from our dreams and our aspirations. And there's nothing wrong to have dreams. There's nothing wrong to have aspirations. However, in the personal section of the book, 
I lay the foundation for how to set expectations. If you want your expectations to be set, you got to ask two questions. One, is the expectation realistic or unrealistic? How do you know? Is it within your control to do it? I believe that whatever is within your control is a realistic expectation. If anything is outside of your control, it is unrealistic to expect. And the second question to set your expectation, if it involves someone else, you have to ask the question, is it spoken or unspoken? Meaning, does it need to be communicated? And until you ask these two questions, your expectations are, are unset. And in order to set them personally, you've got to know what's in your control and what needs to be communicated. Okay, so let's talk about, let's talk about one. And what, can you give me examples of what's in our control that's relatable to the audience and then sure. what, what you would deem or could deem not in our control? Yeah, so in a very, you know, basic sense, what's in my control is me. What's out of my control is you. So often, <laughs> most of our frustration, our anger, our resentment, our disappointment, our bitterness is because we're trying to control people that we have no control over. I don't care if, if you're married to them. I don't care if they birth you. I don't care if you birth them. We have no control over someone outside of us. So just having that revelation can shine a whole light on a whole lot of things. Wow. I only control me. Now, I can influence, I can inspire others, I can motivate, but I can't control. Now, also, let's say in a professional sense. Here we go. So often, we're trying to control what we don't control. And this is in the book, I talk about this. This is kind of counterintuitive. We don't control the result. We control the process. So you won't have a, have a great show. You do, you, no matter how great your show is, you don't actually control who tunes in and when. The only thing that's within your control is the type of show you produce, how well you prepare, the guests that you bring on, the process is in your control. And in my experience, if you want a certain result, the more you put in the process, the greater probability will be that you get the results you want. But trying to control the result at the expense of the process means that you actually have an unset expectation. And, so and these it, are some examples of what you control and what you don't. And the book has a great quote, the process is the result. Yes. That's the fortune yes. cookie like put over your fridge. The process <laughs> yeah. is the result. Now, I will, I will tell you, when people come into Hollywood, Devon, right? So I'm a little older than you, but you've, you've had a ton of experience in this business. I will say to them, like, in the real world, the laws of gravity apply. If I throw this pen up in the air, it's going to come down. In Hollywood, the laws of gravity don't apply. I throw this pen up in the air, it's going to do a figure eight, spin around, go through the ceiling, come back around, you know, like... And and so when I, so talk about anyone who wants to get into show business or you know this part of the business or or even being an influencer or whatever, t like this advice is so spot on because talk about a business you have no control over no. the result, none. Right, and 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 here's the other part where this gets really gets us, and this is what derails a lot of lives and a lot of careers is that trying to control the timing. So you talk about Hollywood, let's use it for an example. Ugh. So every, people come to Hollywood, oh, I wanna make it, I wanna make it, I wanna make it. Great, nothing wrong with wanting to make it, nothing wrong with believing you have the talent. However, when we put a time clock on when it has to happen, and then if it doesn't happen by then, we start to judge ourselves, we start to say something's wrong. We start to get upset. We start to numb ourselves because we don't feel good. That's when it becomes destructive. So when you talk about Hollywood, here's what's in anyone's control, how they show up, how they prepare, their disposition, their attitude, their belief, right? It's okay to believe something that no one else believes about you. Nothing wrong with that. But don't let that belief become a burden. Let that belief remain a blessing. Let it continue to create joy. I talk about this in the book. How do you know if your expectation is working for you or against you? Is it creating more joy or more pain? Mm -hmm. If you have allowed your dream to be a source of pain, not joy, either you have the wrong dream 
or you're putting too much of an expectation on when that dream is supposed to manifest. And we all do that. We all do it. And I've done it. That's why I wrote this book. And that's why I've written the book because I've done it, man. I've, I mean, listen, I'm the poster child of, of judging myself. I mean, you know, I tell a story in the book. I used to work for Sony Pictures Entertainment. I was an executive there. I worked on all kinds of movies from Pursuit of Happiness all the way to, you know, Heaven is for Real. And one of the movies I worked on was the remake of The Karate Kid. And that movie, we made it for $40 million. It starred Jackie Chan and Jaden Smith. Uh, the movie was made in Beijing. Within the course of one year, I went to Beijing nine times overseeing the movie, giving my There was all. so much involved in that film. Oh. I'm telling you as a consumer watching it, I remember, because you know I'm a fan of the whole series in Cobra Kai, and, and I remember seeing, see, oh my goodness, somebody spent real time and money oh, yeah. making oh, this yeah. movie. Oh yeah. It was it was a labor of love and a lot of detail and very it was a very difficult production doing that in Beijing. The Karate Kid remake was the first movie to be made in Beijing since The Last Emperor, the first American movie. And so it was a, we, the, the, China, you know, the China film group was involved. The government was involved. It was a massive undertaking. Long story short, it was successful. Yes. The movie opened to fifty six million dollars, went on to gross almost uh, four hundred worldwide. I made I had an unspoken expectation. I made an assumption that if this movie did well, it would lead me to get promoted and have more, you know, uh, autonomy at the studio. Well, guess what? The movie was successful. One of the most profitable movies, movies that year. Did I get promoted? No. My bosses came to me and said, hey, we got a lot of executives. We wish we could promote you, but we can't. And we have so many executives. You know, we know that you ran this movie, but you're going to have to, you know, also service other executives on their films. I was devastated because I had an expectation that this movie was supposed to deliver a certain result. And not only was I devastated, I began to question myself. Do I have what it takes to make it? Is my dream reality? Am I crazy? Have I been foolish this whole time? All because my expectation was unset. I never asked my bosses, hey, if Karate Kid does well, what can I take away from that? Will it lead me to a promotion? Will I be able to expect that? And whether or not that was possible has nothing to do with my value. I showed my value. I ran a movie internationally successfully that contributed real value to the bottom line of the company. Whether or not the company saw that value, it didn't take away the value I created. The only problem was my expectation that began to taint my point of view of me this is when expectations are dangerous. And this is why I argue in this book, you got to set your expectations and release any expectation that you do not need. That you can't control. And, and you do, there's a, a part in the book about communication and expectations. And so go back because um, what you say is like, okay, let's say I have this expectation that I'm going to kick ass on this movie. Yes. And I'm, you know, my, my goal is to I get a promotion you talk about the communication like you where you may have fallen short was you didn't communicate this perhaps with your superiors and say right can you speak to the communication and expectations and so so anyone on the job something to and i talk about this in the personal section of the book when we talk about managing expectations first and foremost anytime you get a check comes with it expectations so if you don't like the expectations of your job then don't take the check because every check that that clears your bank account is is an expectation agreement for what the job is expecting of you now if you have a desire to move forward or to move up in the job you're never going to move up by just meeting expectations those that usually move up or get promoted exceed the expectation they learn what's expected they learn what their boss wants or needs and they don't only meet it they exceed it now in terms of communication it's really important to get clear on what the expectations are to begin with. Sometimes the expectation of your job may be implied, but there could be some things that are not being spoken that you got to get clarity on because what your boss expects that you don't know is a liability to you. So when we talk about communication, communication is first and foremost, tell me what's expected of this job, what's expected of me. And if I meet that expectation, what then can I expect? Or if I exceed the expectation, what can I expect? 
Is this a place for growth? Is this a place I can map out my entire career? Or is this the type of place that, hey, I do well and it'll set me up for the next job? Like it's okay to communicate in order to know how to navigate your career. This is where so many people miss it. They don't communicate, they're trying to navigate and they hit an iceberg. Yes. You know, why? Yes. Because they could have avoided the iceberg. All they had to do was ask. Communicate to navigate. I love that. And Maria says it all the time. My wife says it all the time about just asking. I feel like a lot of us have a, I call it a Santa Claus mentality where we just <laughs> yeah. expect Santa to come down the chimney and bring yeah. presents, but, you know, and, and because we were good and that's it. And it doesn't work that way. You have we're, to lean in and, you know, and say, like you said, to I keep the love, communicate to navigate. Yeah. And, but even, even Santa asks, are you naughty or nice? Right. True. So you still You're right. You're right. There's an expectation. You're right. You're right. But I think a lot of people go in and grind and grind and grind and grind. And they're just waiting for, you know, the uh, some reward, and and like you said, you you mean like unless you wildly exceed those expectations, you have to communicate. You this, gotta communicate. You, yeah. And, and here's the and here's the truth in my experience, because as I was telling you that Karate Kid experience, and I didn't get promoted, and I was devastated, and I was really trying to figure out what was going on. Devon, how old were you? Can I ask how old were you were at the yeah, time? Yeah, I was. Um, let's see. When we when I did the Karate Kid. That would have been, uh, we're in 2011. I was 30, 30, yeah, around 31, wow. 30, 30, 31, something like that. And you know what? And it's so funny, Devon, because other people look at that on the outside. And I, by the way, I get everything you're saying, 100%. But other people look at that and say, man, you were 31. person, <laughs> The karate kid with Will Smith and dealing with the Chinese government. Like, what are we talking about here? But... I understand. But right. Relative, you know. It is. It is. And, and and but I love the point you're bringing up. Why? Because in the moment, you know, it's like you look at all this stuff and and you we put so much importance on things that later in life we look back and say, "What was I tripping? Like what right? was I doing?" Yes. Now I look back and I say, "Oh man, like I get in the moment why it meant so much, but dude, like whoa, like you were already killing it, man. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, and and who cares if they saw it or not? Like you, you already earned those stripes, so you should have just let you should have let yourself off the hook and just enjoyed the moment. But that's why I wrote this book, and because this is what expectations do to us when we don't set them. They rob us of moments. Yeah. They taint our memory. Oh. They take our joy. Yes. This is why we've got to set them so well. And one thing I'll say is. I, after that moment, I did have communication with my boss. I went to the chairman of Sony, Amy Pascal, and I said, listen, I don't understand. Help me understand what I can expect. I said, because I'm giving my all to this company. The company is making money, but somehow I'm not moving up. I need to understand why. And she gave me a very clear answer and said, hey, you gotta, you, you can't just think that servicing other people's stuff is going to get you where you want to go. She said, that, that movie would have happened with, with or without you. Why? Because that movie happened because of Will Smith and Jaden and as that you serviced that movie. You did a great job. But if you want to get promoted and you want the career, you're going to have to lean into what you can do and nobody else can do. And that was leaning into movies of hope, leaning into movies of faith, leaning into movies that were diverse. And that's what led to, you know, uh, jumping the broom and sparkle and heaven is for real. And now all of the films I'm producing. So I appreciate that feedback that she gave me because it really challenged me to go inside of me to do the things that nobody else can do in this business. I, I'm, I'm stuck on the expectations and how they rob us. So I bring it home. So, you know, um, my, my wife lost her mom and I, you know, lost my mother-in-law who was my mom essentially for two decades. And I'll tell you, Devon is, is Maria is going through videos and photos and she's just like, seeing them all dance and smile and have fun and all these memories being on Rachel Ray with Maria, right? All of it. And Maria's saying, and I, I wish she was doing the show, but I will be sharing everything with her after we wrap. Maria keeps saying like, why I feel like I didn't see any of this at the time. I feel like, you know, and, and it was either expectations of Maria probably, uh, career but i mean even like with the mom and the cancer it was mom don't eat this and eat that and there were so many expectations that kind of blocked both of us from really 
seeing it now, thank God. And by the way, we're blessed to have so much video. My wife, she's a filmmaker, so she records everything. Yeah, right. And we're able to see how happy and stuff. But you, we robbed ourselves because of the expectations. Right. We yeah. robbed ourselves of like, wait, what was I doing? Like, wh why wasn't I not there? And yeah. and I do think that like, if if the process is the result, as you say in the book, and we can embrace that, that already I'm halfway home. <laughs> yeah. No, really. I'm making a movie with Jaden and Will, right? Like right. I'm in right. I'm China, which we know you had to have known by then. China's the future of right. filmmaking. Yeah. Totally. And and I'm a baby. I'm 31, but I get it cuz I I've been just like you and I don't yeah. want to be like this anymore. Right. Exactly. And and the point you're hitting on is so important. The greatest catalyst for change in anyone's life is pain. Until we experience enough pain where we say what you just said, I don't want to be like this anymore. This book is really for those that are in pain because there are some that are not in enough pain yet. <laughs> I'm gonna sleep with it on my chest. <laughs> oh. So this message will not resonate because there's just not enough pain. It's like, all right, I can still deal in my life and I'm not totally happy, but I'm not you know, ready to make a change. But for those that are in so much pain that they yeah. cannot go on any longer the same way. This is your that, book. This book is the catalyst. But can we offer this to, because I always say like, um, people only learn from the lessons they pay for and they pay either with money or they pay in pain. Mm. But I always say like, there is that small percentage out there. My wife happens to be one of them. Like she always was like, if she met someone like you, when she was younger, she'd be like, take all of your info. And she'd be like, he has the experience. I don't. I'm going to listen to him. Like, mm. she wasn't one who had to go through a lot of pain. That's why she, with her career anyway. Yeah. Because she listened to older people who went through the pain for her. I I, I'm hoping, I guess deep down, that there could be a small group of people that, like, if you're not in that pain now, take the lessons now if you're younger because the pain's going to come later if you keep hanging everything on expectations. Yeah. So it's not yes. just, you know, so I get it. Like, it sucks that we have to be brought to our knees. But man, don't I wish for a world where maybe we don't. And so my big thing is I have a lot of young people working for me. And I'm always saying, I'm like, I don't want you to end up like me. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> at like, you can learn everything now. Just listen to me. You're like, you you don't yeah. have to wait 25, 30 more years. You know, anyway, that's me. Yeah, no, it's true. It's true. I mean, you know, my, one of my uh, aunts, you know, great aunts, she would tell me, you have to live it to learn it. I know. You know and, and a lot of times, you know, look, I my hope, my deepest hope is that someone who's not in a tremendous amount of pain would read this book and say, oh, OK, preemptively, me, you know, yeah, preemptively, yeah, let me preemptively avoid the pain yes. that expectation can can create. But sometimes um, independent of bumping our head, we may never, you know, get to the place we're supposed to be. Um, oh, this is a great one, guys. And again, this is good for young people to hear. And by the way, all people should hear this because expectation without participation equals devastation. Do you know what that means, Kelsey? Can you tell? Can no. you guess? Mm -mm. Expectation want... okay. without participation, without doing the work, okay. equals devastation. In other words, for all those people on the bar stools, like I always say, I'm mm -hmm. old. They're not mm -hmm. in bar stools anymore, but maybe they're in front of YouTube or they're in front of their video game. And they have these high expectations. Right. And they're not doing anything. But they're not participating yeah, yeah. in the process and right. the work. Right. But now they're devastated. How many people after are just devastated? Right. Because because they weren't willing to participate. And they so part now, of the now don't, that was my like layman's interpretation of this, <laughs> Devon. You 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 school us on that one. Yeah. No. I mean, there's a uh, scripture that says faith without works is dead. And so it's this idea that you know, oh, okay, I'm just going to have these expectations. But I'm not going to participate in the process. I'm not going to evaluate if the expectation is set. I'm not going to work hard. I'm not going to discipline. I'm just going to have these expectations that this is what life is supposed to deliver. Yep. That's the danger in an expectation. It is a strong belief about what should happen. Should based on, on what? Based on what? So if, let's say you're talking about one of you know millennial you know becoming successful and wanting like okay well where is it written that by 25 you should make six figures or you should be in the job of your dreams or you should be in a relationship that you 
really care about and that you love. Where is it written? It's not. It's not. So the idea of treating a possibility as a certainty is what is driving this generation crazy. Yes. It's nothing wrong with saying, oh, I'd like to. It would be great if. And I'm going to participate in the process because I know that'll help me potentially achieve the result. But to sit back and act like life is a genie or a vending machine, and all you got to do is just put in an expectation and it comes out. This is why so many people are secretly yes. devastated. And, and by the way, I think it's all generations have these judgmental expectations. I, 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 I will say... Um, I feel like with the younger generation, I think a lot of expectations were met by parents and teachers. I don't think it was their fault. I think, you know, so, and now they're coming out to the real world, it doesn't work that way. You have to, right? right? You have to put in the work. It's, you know, it's not just going to happen. No, not. And, and, and honestly, I think sometimes parents and, um, you know, teachers can do, you know, to do people a disservice. Yeah. Uh, because life does not coddle you, it doesn't coddle me. No. <laughs> life is life. Yes. And the better, I think the better children and teenagers and, you know, young adults are prepared to deal with the realities of life, the better. And life is not going to give you what you want when you want it. Life is not going to always care about all the hard work you put in. It's not going to, it doesn't work that way. Life is about endurance. Life is about navigating the unexpected. Life is about appreciating the moment. And the more I believe that we practice those things, the better we are to succeed at life. I'll tell you about the expectations thing. It's funny. I, I don't want to throw anyone to the bus in my family, but I I, uh, I have, you know, we have some funeral services coming up for my mother-in-law and a, like super close family member who, by the way, is older. So not from the millennial culture said on the night of the event said, wait, but I, I have plans that night. <laughs> but you know what? But I, first of all, laughed i thought it was hilarious because i know this person i know what they're like and my wife was really upset i'm like maria i expected nothing i had right. no expectation because yeah. I, i've seen this person in the past is you know how they are right i already know so like <laughs> right. I, you know so for me i if, if if the reaction i got was humor i'm like i needed a laugh right now i actually think it's amazing right. but but now that you're um clarifying all this it's because i didn't have the expectation there because, you go. because we expect right that's another thing too no one was here for me when i was uh, sick during covid or no right but it's all based on expectations totally. those are the it, personal it, ones right those are yeah those are the personal ones and relational as well they also apply in relational um because you know we're, we're expecting so much what about what about just taking the expect wherever you can release an expectation do it so I operate in the world based upon how I operate. So meaning I give because I'm a giving person. I care because I'm a caring person. I'm not giving to get. I'm not caring because I want that person to return the favor. They may never. They might. They might not. I don't know. I do believe that what you sow, you reap. It, just, it doesn't mean that, we're, that you're going to reap it from where you sowed it. And a lot of times we're trying to reap kindness because we sold it into a person. So just because you gave consideration to somebody doesn't mean that when you're in need, they're gonna give you the same consideration. So give freely, love freely, care freely, and release the expectation that the person you're giving that love to is gonna do the same. Release it, let them be who they wanna be. And if it comes back to you from that person, wonderful. And if it doesn't, it's okay. It's going to come back one way or another. It will come back one way or another. It's and when I think of like, I think of Maria's dad, who's like 70 something, he doesn't expect anything from anybody. He doesn't ever get offended or hurt. And he's such mm -hmm. a happy and healthy person because of it. Yeah. Because, I mean, I talked about this earlier. You know, I, I talked about this in the book. Expectations are weights. Yeah. So I don't believe you should, you should live with no expectation, right? It's like, it's like going to the gym. You gotta have a little bit of resistance to improve your strength. So with expectations, you know, I'll say it's okay. We have some expectations. They're set. Okay, cool. So I, I'm I'm managing the weight because it's actually making me strong. But, but when I have so many expectations, it actually makes me weaker. So it's really about calibration. Calibrating the expectations. There you go. So you release what you don't need, and those that you do have, you make sure. Okay. You're safe.
So give me, Devon, can you give me some examples of like healthier expectations we can have? Yeah, so, so for example, of yourself, of myself, the healthier expectation is that I will achieve my dreams, but I'm not going to drive myself crazy about when they happen. I am on the path. So it's like, all right, we put the destination in Uber, right? We put the destination in, mm-hmm. in our, in our ways, right? Yep. We put the destination in and what do you do? You drive. Okay. I'm gonna get there. It tells me, yeah, okay, cool. I can, I can relax. That's a great way to have a healthy expectation. I will be successful in this field. I will put in the time. I will continue to believe in my dream, but I'm going to relax and let it come to me when it's time. It will be revealed when it's time for me to leave this job or to push for the promotion as long as I stay easy about it. Here's another healthy expectation. I love, let's say you're in a marriage or relationship. Yeah, I want to ask about relationships. I love, I love my partner. But just because I love them and they love me doesn't mean that they know what it is I'm expecting. So a healthier expectation, instead of expecting, oh, they love me, they're supposed to know what I need. And if they don't know it, I'm not going to tell them. Because the fact that they don't know means they don't really love me. Those are all assumptions and mostly incorrect. A healthier expectation in a relationship is this. Whatever my needs are, one, I'm going to be in touch with those needs. Two, I will communicate. Communicate. Yes, back to that. And three, I will give the other person the opportunity to say yes or no about whether or not they can meet those needs. Too often, especially in a relationship or marriage, we have these expectations that this person is supposed to be our everything. They're supposed to make us happy. They're supposed to read our mind. And we want to know why we're not happy is because we have an unhealthy expectation of the person that we're with. A healthy expectation is, I'm not going to ask you to do anything for me. I don't do for myself. And I am not going to try to put you in a prison of, of my expectation. Here's what I'd like. If you want to do that, great. If not, let me know. Maybe I'm supposed to get that need met in another way. Here's the other thing I'll say about this real quick, which is, This idea, oh, this person makes me happy. This is a toxic idea to me. Why? Because anyone that makes you, when you talk about making, that means creating. So anyone we allow to create happiness in us, we are outsourcing the fact that we should be the creator of our happiness. I believe others can contribute to our happiness, but not make us happy. Because the same person that makes you happy, the same person that's going to make you sad. And, and maybe it's a way of maybe even communicating it's more, I enjoy being around this person. I enjoy this person's company sure. rather than sure. this person sure. makes me happy. Absolutely. I enjoy this person. I enjoy that this person, that my well-being is a priority to this person that really makes me feel good. I love that. You know, however, I'm able, when, when I am the keeper of my happiness and I do the things that make happy, make me happy, I am better able to evaluate when others are making a contribution to my happiness and I'm less needy. What happens is in a relationship, a lot of times people are putting on their partner what they are not doing for themselves. And also people expect from their partners to do something that they don't even know about themselves. So when you're talking about in a relationship, oh, I want this person to make me happy. Well, if you don't even know what makes you happy, how do you expect somebody else that doesn't even know you as well as you know yourself to know things about you that you don't even know yet? <laughs> this is the reason why I wrote this book, because I'm like, there, we're living in, in we're, a lot of people are living in, in insanity. Yes. Like, and, and, you, and you, think, you think, Devon? <laughs> <laughs> yes. You're right. Oh, I will tell you, I think the blind spot in my, to be candid with you, the blind spot in my 20 year relationship was what you just said is I placed very high expectations and, and did not communicate them and then maybe tried to, but then also didn't even know myself what I wanted. And I think also it was stuff I didn't want to do for myself. And I, and, and recently, like in the last year or two, I'm like realizing like, wait, that's 
what was I doing? Like they, I, that, that's on me, you know, but I think it speaks to me. So it has to speak to other people where, totally. you know, well, I do this, totally. I clean up and I cook and I do, you know, and, and you have all these expectations. Um, totally. I mean, I, I haven't been married as long as you. I've been married about nine years, but I, you know, I've been guilty of the same thing. Guilt of exact same thing. Really? High expectations. Oh my goodness. You know, high expectations of myself high expectations of my wife, not communicating the expectations, judging her if she doesn't meet certain expectations. So as I have gone on this journey within my marriage and come you know, into clarity about these concepts, uh, it has allowed me to alleviate that, that pressure and that stress because I'm like, wait a minute. First of all, why are my expectations for myself so high that they're depressing me, number one? And number two, just because they're my expectations doesn't mean that I, I get the right to impose those expectations on other people. I talk about this in the book. It's dangerous when we take our expectations and we make them standards by which others should live by. That's dangerous. That's Don't you think that's the globe right now? <laughs> that's exactly what's happening. It's what's happening. It's what's, it's what's happening. Just because it's what I expect of my life, that doesn't mean that then I get the right to make that the standard by which you should live by in your life. And and now, how do you have children yet? Do you, you uh, and Megan? Yet. Not, not yet. Okay. This, so it'll be interesting to see how this applies. I have to think it applies to parenting. Oh, right. Yeah. Of course it does, in a big way, because you know, growing up, you know, my mother, she didn't really impose you know professional expectations on, on us, which I appreciated. You know, the moment I told her, hey, I want to go to Hollywood and pursue that, she never was uh, negative about that. There were other people in my family that were like, hey, you know, you can't go to Hollywood and, you know, that's a that's a dark place and mm -hmm. all of that. And I was yep. like, well, yep. I'm going to go because I believe that's where I'm supposed to be. But one of the challenges in my observation of parenting is when parents put these expectations on their children. Now, remember, you can only set an expectation if one it is within your control. And two, if it's communicated. So let's apply that to the lens of children. So often what happens, parents are trying to control something that's not in their control, which is their child. The process is the result. So if you want your child to become something in the world, then you gotta control the process of discipline, of communication, of loving, of acceptance. What about acceptance? accepting your child for who you who they are not who you hope they would be because putting that level of expectation of here's what you as a child should do and then they don't meet it that can be very disruptive oh. for the development of a child because it, it's too much pressure it's like oh my goodness i'm not making mom happy i'm not making dad happy i'm not making you know so then i'm not worthy it's it's a it's a slippery slope so I do believe that there's a lot that can be taken away from uh, this book as it relates to, to parents. And, and I think a lot of children, I, I, so I hear from a lot of like 20 somethings, let's say, and again, especially women that are like, my parents expect this. They expect mm -hmm. me to uh, take the road most traveled. They expect me to marry this kind of person by this age, It's you know, and, and it really becomes, a, it's hard enough, life is hard enough, but then, when they're contending with that, it's one of the things I deal with all the time. I, you know, from the young generation, especially when they come out to Hollywood, I always ask, "Where's mom and dad with all this?" Yeah, are they on board? And, they, you know, yeah, it's hard. It's it's hard. Yet, um, again, whose life are you living? So, at the end of the day, it's you know, someone who's struggling with what they want to do versus what their parents want them to do. At the end of the day, you got to ask the question: Whose life am I living? Yeah. And if I please my parents, but I disappoint myself, can I live with that? That's the question. And it's like, all right, well, if I can't live with that, then I've got to go do what I believe I'm supposed to do and trust that my parents at some point will be okay. And even if they're never okay, that's okay too. It is. It really is. It needs to be. And I think, but I think that if, if you live, you know, by these principles you're talking about, if you do the work, if you're ethical, if you, if you, you know, in my experience, I've seen it in the end work out where their parents go. Now, of course, in your case, they go, oh, my God, we get it. <laughs> like, you know, because you see, <laughs> right. But 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 uh, I've seen the parents kind of come around and come to that place to go. 
okay i re in most cases but like you said even if they don't it's got to be for you yeah it's got you got and that's what this book is about living free you got to live free you you can't let you can't be under the emotion the emotional physical or mental control of anyone or anything you set the expectations by what you by by the you set the expectations by that you want to live by and you set the course for your life you don't let anybody else do that work for you and and, and devon talk about how this relates to social media <laughs> yeah oh right oh boy I talk about this in the book yeah too often we're, we're we're creating these false expectations because of social media we're looking at other people's lives and we're comparing and despairing and the more we compare the more we despair and so social media is like you could be having a great day you go on social media and then all of a sudden you feel devastated and you're like why oh because i'm looking at somebody else's life and i'm saying well why is that happening for them and not for me why do they get this many likes on a video why do they have this many followers and here is the reality none of it matters tomorrow Facebook could decide we're shutting down Instagram. We're shutting down Facebook. It's all over. Does that mean your destiny is over? Does that mean your purpose is over? Right. No, it's, it, it's, it's this crazy fictitious, uh, uh, a barometer that we allow ourselves to be judged by. And it's not real. It's not real. It doesn't matter your success in the world. Don't get me wrong. Social media is a powerful tool when used appropriately. I'm not right. knocking the power. No, no, I, nor am I. Yeah. But when it becomes a barometer by which we judge ourselves and whether or not we're good and whether or not we're worthy and whether or not we're talented, that to me is when it becomes toxic. And that's when it can really become uh, disruptive when we're talking about expectations. When it becomes a barometer, that's when social media. Yeah. And, and also, most people don't. And one of the reasons why I wrote, wrote the book is because most people aren't living free. They're, they're living for likes. They're living for views. I can't even come up with the words for that because it, it's so true, but it's madness. It's madness. It's madness. And I'm not even madness. saying I'm not guilty of it. It's madness. It's madness. And when you watch, you know, documentaries like. Like, uh, what was it called? It was called, uh, it wasn't called the social network. Oh, it was on, it was on, uh, Netflix and it, and it really went into all the yeah. manipulation, the social, the social experiment. Yes. And when you watch that, you realize like, oh, this, th that social media, the creation of social media was very similar to the creation of McDonald's fries. They are intentionally made to be addictive. Okay. <laughs> social media is made to make us value ourselves it's it's it was created that way so that we can't get off the hamster wheel we don't know how it, to unplug. it's basically cigarettes mm -hmm. completely completely so this is why i one of the reasons i wrote this book to say hey we got to get out of the matrix we got to unplug i want this book to be a smelling salt for some i needed to wake you up i need you to realize there's a whole other life out there Devon, and you start living it. You would love this. I, I was I was at a local pond this week, you know, trying to get to nature and just sitting there. And there was a dad who was telling me about, yeah, you know, my 12, he was old by this point. He was like, yeah, my 12 year old kids, what they used to do down here for fun. And he's like, they would get, they would, they would get big giant rocks and they would walk through the pond and then they'd be underwater, water for a certain portion. They'd hold their breath and then they'd come up and go back to the side. And I was like, why he's like well they're just they're just kids they're boys that that's what they and i'm like you know what what happened to that that's awesome like you know what i mean like i was like let's right. walk across a pond carrying a rock and it was right. fun yes yeah but now it's like oh, oh yeah i was like wait so wait did, okay then when they got to the side was did you have xbox set up for them was, <laughs> yeah. where, where, did they have their iphone like wait what am i missing in the story <laughs> but that's one of the dangers of you know what's happening right now is that you know i have nieces and nephews and 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 they're so conditioned that every moment has to be filled with something mm. activity expecting oh well i yeah. can't just sit well yeah just there's not no there's nothing to do read a book relax that's it that's it chill it's okay you don't have to be running from you know this practice and that practice and yeah, being on the phone and da -da -da. that's good you don't have anything to do that's great a lot of a lot of things are going to come out of boredom a whole lot of things so it's all right
You don't have to have an expectation that you got to be busy every minute of every day. We just who was the DJ that said to us recently, or through a friend, that the, his best work came through boredom. Oh, Skrillex. Yeah, he said my yeah. best everything came through boredom. All my, my greatest works. Yeah. Totally, totally. There's there's so much because a lot of times we can't hear what's going on on the inside and messages that God may want to get to us when we're so busy. So busy. And we're distracted. So so Devon, because I know I I don't have you long, but there's a couple of really important ones. I I think I want to I want to be able to go over if it's okay. Um, problems are God trying to wake you up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Problems are God because see, we're we're on the hamster wheel. We're in the routine, right? We're just going from one thing to the next. We're busy. We're busy. We get up in the morning. We scroll. We go to work. We scroll. We do the work. We come home. We eat. We watch TV. So we're doing this. And sometimes, unless we have a problem to solve, or a problem, unless a problem hits our life, we just stay on the hamster wheel. We just keep going through the routine. Now, here's what happens when we're in the routine. We actually aren't living. How? So take, for example, where, where your studio is, you know how to get there. So let's say you're at home and you're coming to the studio. I bet there are days you drive and you get to the studio and you're like, oh, I didn't even, how did I get here? Didn't even realize. Yes. Why? Because your subconscious took over. You, it's like, oh, I got it. You can relax. We know how to get there. Same thing in life. When we're in the routine, we're not actually conscious. Our subconscious has taken over. When problems hit our lives, it wakes us up. Wait, 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 what's going on? Right. Oh, hold on. No, I don't like that. Why don't I like it? Oh, no, no, that's not what I, I want to be. So sometimes as much as we want to get out of a problem and solve a problem, I think problems are a lot of times a blessing in disguise. Yeah, so, so again, bringing it home, you know, Maria's mom passes and mm. she looks through all these videos and says, oh, my God, all my mom did was smile. I didn't even realize that. And so all these realizations are coming through the problem of her death, waking her up and me up for when we move forward to be more present, maybe slow yeah. things down a little bit, you know, with the time we have left. But I love that. I think that is so important. And 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 this is a huge one. Oh, Americans. And by the way, this I think it's just Western civilization needs to hear this. It's not them, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> please. Oh, please expand on this. Exactly. I, I before, you know, we go point the finger that that they're the problem or whoever the they is. Cuz they are. It's really us. It could be how we're looking at them, what the situation is, our expectation of them. It's us. So, because it's so easy, the easiest thing to do is a point the finger. Yeah. You're wrong. You're treating me this way versus saying, okay, well, did I allow myself to be in a situation where I could be treated that way? You know, did I allow myself to look at something that way? So I always think that the best way to take control of our life is to take control of me. What's, what's going on in me? Okay, got it. Wow, that's a problem. That's my problem. That's not her problem or his problem. You know, so I do think it's very critical, critical before we point the finger to point the finger inside and start looking at us. Because a lot of our problems, especially relationship problems, are because it's us. It's not them. And and you and you have the belief that I hear from other philosophers too about um sometimes the things we <clears throat> hate or judge in others are actually <laughs> things right. that are wrong with us can, can you yes. do you subscribe to that yes yes i i believe that wholeheartedly that a lot of times the things we fall, fall are finding fault in and others because we find that fault in ourselves going back to what we talked about earlier that high expectation if i have that high expectation of me a lot of times i'm going to be tempted to have an high expectation of others versus saying hey you know this is my issue not their issue my need to achieve is my need to achieve just because they don't have the same need doesn't make them lazy. It doesn't make them less disciplined. They just see life differently. And that's okay. So when we get to a place of appreciating ourselves and who we are, then we can start to appreciate others. So yes, absolutely, it all starts here. I have like the regular guy life hacks to this when I'll say to I'll say to Kelsey or I'll our producer is an overachiever and I'll say to my wife Maria, I'm like, if everyone worked at your capacity, you you wouldn't be the star. You wouldn't be standing out. Is that what you want? You know what I mean? Right? Right, right. And, and that's the thing. It's like, hey, everybody is different. So also, here's the other thing. To that point, if somebody has that level of capacity and they're working that hard and they're doing those things, they reap the rewards of what that brings. Yes. 
So a lot of times people want the rewards, but they don't want to go. Oh, I, I think that's a Western thing. Yes, <laughs> we want the rewards, people. right? But we don't want. You know, it's very easy for somebody to look at my life and say, "Oh, oh my goodness, you have all these rewards, and I want all that." It's like, okay, let me tell you my schedule. Yeah, let me tell you all that I got to yep. do. Let me tell you how I do it. You sure you still want these rewards, right? It's uh, there's a whole lot that goes on that people never see. They never, you know, even even when you look at some of the influencers, if you knew their lives of waking up and this photo and this video and all the stress and aggravation, I will tell you, I would, I would put my head in the noose if that were my life every day. I am not suited for that. I don't. I I respect those that are social media influencers and that's their life. I respect it. It would drive me crazy. But it's so much work. It's so much it's work. It's so much Just work so that much. I'm not willing to do. Me either, without a doubt. Like, yeah. again, I, I don't have a problem with social media. I use it as a tool to get my message out. I use it as a tool to continue to connect with people. But, like, you know, I'm not taking 30 pictures to post one. I'm not recording 20 videos to, to yeah, post one. No. I can't do it. That's just not me. It's That's not me not either. Me. Um, I think what nice way to end it is is – you talk about cultivating faith to get our hope back. And I think people want to get hope back now more than ever after this last couple of years of the pandemic. Can you talk about that? Yeah. You know, I mean, let's be honest. Um, Hope is what keeps us alive. When we no longer have hope, that's when our dreams die. That's when our vision dies. That's when we die. We no longer have hope. So part of cultivating faith is to get you back into believing again. You know, and, and and part of faith is not to look at what we see physically to determine what we believe. When I start to cultivate faith, I start to close my eyes and I start to allow the trailer for my life to play on the screen of my mind. The images, the ideas, the places I want to go, the people I want to meet, the experiences I want to have, I let that, I start to cultivate my faith because I start to get reacquainted with those visions and those images. And then when I open my eyes, I let the vision I saw here give me hope, even in the face of what I don't see here. This is how, this is how we get our hope back. We believe, we see here, we believe, and we move in the direction of that belief. And we trust that every day, if I cultivate that hope, if I keep that faith strong, that I eventually will get to where I'm supposed to be. And I will get there having enjoyed the process because I allowed myself to live free where I didn't allow what I saw to dictate how I felt. Yes. I went on the inside and I said, ooh, that vision is good. I'm having a good day. Well, you know you can't pay your bills. Great. You know what? I can't pay them today, but money's on the way. You know that they don't want to hire you. That's all right. Somebody does. Somebody out there wants to hire me. Every day is getting better. Like when you and I start to flip it, flip the script, and we start to take a detriment and we make it an asset to our to our affirmation. Oh wow, everything in our life turns around. So that's how we begin to cultivate faith in order to get our hope back. And you know, and I believe um, I have this theory about our country. I feel like you know the World War II generation experienced depression and war um and they're most of them are gone now they're you know they're mid to late 90s i feel like we have a lot of potholes we have a lot of blind spots yes we and we have to work at them but i think at the end of the day i still feel like we're 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 wired this is going to be so simplistic we're we're wired in this country to have a good time we didn't <laughs> yeah. we didn't grow up with death and famine and you know what i mean we didn't it, it, around us you know and so i feel like I feel like at we're gonna work, we're gonna work a lot of this stuff out. It's gonna be pain, like you said, which you know is is growth, and this is how we learn. But I feel like it's gonna lead to a good place. I do. I feel like a new place. A new is kind of scary. But I think at the end of the day, I don't think people want to. I just don't think people want to kill each other. I think there's a fringe, yes, but I feel like mankind in in our country. I don't know. Maybe yeah. I'm just maybe I'm oversimplifying it, but I think we we like New Year's Eve. We like nightclubs. <laughs> we love music. 
But I think that's not just inclusive to us. I think that's just humanity. I humanity. think it is too, but I can only speak to what our country because I, I live here. Yeah, but I, I you know, and I and what we're going we're going through right now. So that's why I think, and I think hope uh absolutely is what we have to hang on to. And that's you know, so that's my what I I I, I believe in like I and I obviously have that hope. But I think uh yeah, I yeah. think all of this stuff and man expectations and and you know there's a girl gabby bernstein has she talks yeah. about the judgment detox Sister. right she's amazing right I love her. right and i think that that's judgment judging others and it, it kind of is in line with what you're saying about expectation yeah. you know releasing ourselves of that freeing oh. ourselves of that live free you know what i mean of live free yeah. yeah i mean it's so think about how much stress it is when we become the judge and jury for people it's just like, you know what? Listen, hey, I may have an opinion, I may have a thought, but you know what? What's what's meant to be for you is going to be for you. I'm not, I'm not your judge, your jury. I, I'm not your warden. I, I'm sorry, I'm not. And anytime I try to make myself more than what I'm supposed to be in your life, I'm the one that gets stressed out. Yeah. Yes. And you know, sometimes it's habitual. I think it's a habit. You know, ha people are in, we're in a habit of being judge, jury. An yes. executioner, oh. and so I think that with the book, if you can be more conscious of it, you can break that habit. So you're not, okay. you know, you remember. You say, I know with Gabby, and she loves it because I'll always say judgment detox, judgment detox. Because when I start yeah. doing it, well, it's a habit. I've been doing it for so long, Devon. You know, so now to get like to that place of like, you know, what am I doing? Judgment detox. No, like I love that. In anyway, and I think now it's going to be expectations that, that I'm going to keep saying it. And I just remind people like, wait, expectations, you know, can we control yeah. these? Can we not, you know, do we have control over these? Don't we? Um, That's right. But they really set up such unhappiness. And I think that, uh, and man, I hate to take one. You might be so onto something here. I hate to take one giant brush to paint to all of our problems right now, but it's hard not to say that so many are based on expectations. <laughs> they are <laughs> right yeah they are they really are okay they really are and that's that's why i wrote this book yeah it's amazing you guys the book is available devon franklin live free exceed your expect your highest expectations um and please look into his other books as i'm going to um thank you so much for this gift you gave us today and uh, i i hope you and i stay in touch i learned i learned so much and your wife is beautiful and she's amazing. She was a gift to our show as well. And um, and I know Maria's going to want to get her hands on you in a great way. <laughs> so when she comes <laughs> back, I'd love to talk about some of the other books too because there's awesome. so many lessons here. Awesome. Thank you so Thank much, you Dee. So I much. appreciate it. Oh, I appreciate you. And wow. Yes. Wow. Do we have... I think we need to have one of these shows where we don't say wow. Wow. <laughs> I really think we have to get the author. I can make that happen. We have to get the author of F Like a Goddess. <laughs> who's been... We, Honestly, her that, book might be really good. Okay. See, so you think we'll still say wow? Yeah. Okay. Because it's a subject no one talks anyway, about, so she might have a lot of stuff to say. But expectations. Yeah, no, crazy. Right? Crazy. It's just it, yeah. All right, how do we apply this though? We get all these great lessons, Kelsey. I know. I, and that's then a, if it's we like had more for great longer, lessons and more great lessons. I but I think it's about we have to spend the, all of us have to spend the time to really just apply these things. But but it might just be a matter of writing down some of these things. Yeah. You know. I was thinking that too. I was like, if we had him for one more second, I was gonna ask, okay, like what's the first thing, like a simple first thing we can do? But I'm sure he would just say, kind of like examine what is going on or happening in your life right now. Well, I think if you break it down to your career and right. your maybe your social or personal life. Right. So you, you, you when you start with your career, like what are your expectations and what can you control? Right. And what can't you control? And I think obviously it's like well, I'm gonna embrace the process and mm -hmm. not the result. Mm -hmm. Um and I think in your relationships too. Yeah. Like, why am I expecting? Mm. But I'm at my best when I don't. Oh, my gosh. We all are. When I that, don't That expect. hit me when I was reading this. It was like, okay, not only the expectations we put on ourselves, but that we put on others. I was like, holy yeah. shit. Because then that's when we're hurt. That's when our feelings, yeah. I mean, like. How come you didn't call? Right. 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 
It's like, because we're, yeah, it's, it's crazy. And I think you communicate, hey, this is what I need. And right. then it's up to that person to go, I can't fulfill that need. And then it's up to you to say, okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> that that <does>. jazz. Exactly. <laughs> right? Or, or, yeah. Hey, queen. Queen. Right. Thank you. We didn't tell them about our philosophy, but hey, no, queen, by betches. Next time. Next time. Next time, for sure. But yeah, expectations in the book is uh, live free, mm -hmm. see direct, highest expectations. It's out now. Devon Getting Franklin. on Amazon. What a great guy. Yeah, he's awesome. Really, really special guy. And once again, whew, something I needed to hear Me too. today. Of all days. Anyway, um, yeah, Kelsey. Yeah, Kevo. Until then, what? Until then, you guys. Be nice people, make good choices, and just a quick shout out to Winnie, who is in my lap right now, who has been wonderful throughout this entire episode. Yeah. She's doing such a good job. So, be nice people, make good choices, and be present.